Today, I've decided to do a little bit of an examination surrounding the effects which are induced in certain compounds once they are irradiated with some intense amounts of ionizing radiation. This is the same effect which I demonstrated shortly in some sodium chloride in one of my x-ray videos, the BSV-10 tube. I will do this same experiment this time, but with a lot more salts and also some minerals. Plus, that the tool which I will use to irradiate will be a little bit different, because today I'm using a homemade cathode ray tube, which you can see in this black horrible box right here. This tube can supply a lot higher, a lot more ionizing radiation to the sample compared to any X-ray tube, as an X-ray tube has a really low efficiency of less than one percent. While in here we have cut off the middleman, which would be the metal target, the anode, and instead we'll shoot direct the electrons directly at the samples to induce the effect we want. So taking a bit of a closer look. At the tube, you can see that it's in the middle of this lead box. It's certainly no masterpiece, but it does the job incredibly well. The reason for the lead is because, well, I'm a good boy now, I don't exceed the regulatory limits in X-ray dose rates, so I have to utilize this lead and also some glass panels. I got two of them, which will be put in front of the and whole apparatus to shield any parasitic x-rays being generated though at the voltages which I'll be using now should not be much of a problem. The tube is quite small it's about I believe 18 millimeters in diameter so I will only be able to radiate some very small samples but it should still get a very interesting effect I also see some cool different types of luminescence induced once the electrons hit the target. The high voltage supply is this one, the white one in the middle. You can ignore these two, they are irrelevant to this examination. I will use this one, which is a, a variable high voltage supply. It can go up to, from 5 kilovolts to 30 kilovolts up to 10 milliamps and I'll be using it at probably about 20 kilovolts for this examination as the lead is still not thick enough to handle 30 kilovolts to a legal extent that is. Surrounding the samples which will be radiated I have them right by the side. To begin with I have some, pota some potassium iodide you can see it's turned a bit of a yellow color from decomposing a bit, as I've had it quite a while. Then, I have some sodium chloride, normal table salt, which uh, should be iodine free. You can see a bit of a discoloration already, it's because I've already tested this experiment once. But this should not really affect our result whatsoever. Then, probably my favorite sample, potassium bromide. This will hopefully be really cool to see, as the effect which is induced is quite beautiful and magnificent. I also got a small piece of fluorite, and that will pretty much be it. I got a few minerals too. But they will not be radiated, they have already been irradiated and will be demonstrated at the end. Before I turn everything on and show you the effect, I'll also tell you a bit about the pump, as this tube uses a temporary vacuum, which is necessary as I need to input samples back and forth. So I have a vacuum pump connected to the whole setup. It's a two-stage pump which has an ultimate vacuum of 0.3 pascals, or which is like 2.25 millitor. It's excellent for this purpose, almost a bit too good. And to input the samples in the tube later, 
I got this rubber stopper, which you can see at the bottom, which seals the vacuum. So, here we are at the base of the tube. You can see the little tube stick right here. It's quite dark, and I'm sorry for that. I do not have any more lightning. But to begin with, I'll do probably my favorite sample of them all to kind of kickstart this whole examination. That will be potassium bromide. If the camera would like to focus, of course. Yes, a bit of potassium bromide, which I'll put at the bottom, a very fairly thin layer, maybe 0.1 grams, at the bottom of this glass vial. This is because plastic would melt inside of the tube, as it can heat up quite a lot. So I'll put a small amount, like that. You can see a little pile. This is everything we need to get a very, very strong result. I'll insert the sample, hopefully not block the camera too much. Just put it inside of the tube, and very lightly insert a rubber stopper. And then I'll turn on the pump, which will probably be quite loud. I'm really sorry for that. And then I screw this um, rubber stopper a bit tighter and it's ready to irradiate. Of course, we need one final safety measure. The glass plate before we can really irradiate something. Okay, well, I found a better glass plate, which is bigger, of course. Than the thick one. I usually use um, the thick one and another piece of glass which covers all of it. But I'll use this plate. You can see that it covers the whole front, but it's just good enough for this experiment. So I picked up the camera. Here is the whole tube with the sample at the bottom. I'll turn on a high voltage supply at about. 20 kilovolts, and I'll run it pulsed. I'll turn off the light so you can see how the tube looks once it's turned on. So I'll turn on the pulsed mode, and you can see some plasma and some luminescence induced in the tube. I'd say that this is really fascinating. I'm absolutely astonished by the glow. You can see that the glass at the bottom gives a kind of a spooky whitish glow. We turn it on constantly. You can see the tube. And the spooky glow. So we'll do it pulsed as uh, constant power will heat up the sample and also damage the tube. But I think we have irradiated it enough for now to gain a really vibrant result. So I'll turn it off, turn on the lights again, and we'll check out the sample. Here we are. Let's see. As you can see, the what used to be white potassium bromide has turned into a very vibrant blue color. The camera doesn't like the focus. You can see, there's certainly been quite a change in color. That's quite spectacular, I'd say. Really beautiful. And I hopefully it was quite cool. But now we'll move on to not waste too much time. We'll now do the sodium chloride and we'll do the exact same procedure. So I'll set up all of that and not waste too much of your time. Here is the sample. I'll irradiate it with pulsed mode at 20 kilovolts, 10 milliamps for about a minute. And I'll be right back once the results are ready to be inspected. So, 
I'm just on the radio doing it. Sample is at the bottom. I'll see if I can. So carefully take it off with one hand. And look at that. It's it has turned orange. This is normal table salt, iodine free. So I pour it out on this piece of paper quite crudely to show the effect better. Look at that. Hopefully you find it also quite cool. But nevertheless, let's move on to a third sample, potassium iodide. So I'll do the exact same procedure once more. Here is the sample. So, it's been about a minute now, hopefully we shall see a similar effect induced in this sample. Let's see if I can remove the sample. Here it is. You can see that there's definitely a change in color. It's a bit green orangey. I'll pour it out on this piece of paper once more. Here it is. Yeah, it's a bit green, orange colored. This seemed to be because, well, it has not achieved a high enough dose. Normally, this sample would be entirely green. And later, once exposed to light for a period of time, decompose and turn into a more normal, well, similar to the um, sodium chloride, which was orange. It will stay orange. Anyways, now we'll move on to some other pretty cool samples. They are cool because another, another much more spectacular effect is induced, but only temporarily. And to see this effect, we'll start off by using some fluorite crystal. I'll put it in the same manner as the other samples, except I'll see if I can put it closer to the anode by putting it on top of this vial, or a similar vial, which is not broken at the bottom. So the sample has been put in within the tube. You can see it right at the anode wire maybe hard to see though. There it is. I'll now actually run the tube at a constant output. So I'll put in glass plate. I'll turn up the lights and lower the voltage to slowly increase it. So now we got the high voltage on and I'm slowly increasing it. As the vacuum gets better, we need a higher voltage. There you can see that there's something glowing with an orange tint. And this is the um, fluorite crystal. It's fluorescing with a beautiful orange glow once it's bombarded with electrons. <laughs> That's really cool. The green stuff which you're seeing is uh, normal uh, non-radioactive coat paint. I used zinc sulfide to kind of calibrate the tube and it accidentally got on the inside. But that's... I love this effect. I think it's beautiful. Now we're at the max at 20 kilovolts. Really magnificent. 
It kind of holds the glow a very short period of time after radiation. Very short. That's it for fluoride. Fluorite. But there's one more cool thing about it, which I will show just a bit. Remove it. Let's see, accidentally dropped it. Okay, I got it. Here's the interesting thing, which I would like to show. So if I put an unirradiated piece of fluorite on the paper, you can see it's a bit bluish in color. Here's the irradiated piece. You can see that it has turned a bit orange. There's certainly a big difference. This seems to be permanent. I think it can be removed by heating the sample to very high temperatures. And another interesting thing, which will be the final, is what happens with quartz. Because if you look, the right piece is quite brown, while the left piece is quite clear and white in color. And as you may guess, the right sample has indeed been irradiated within this tube for, I believe it was half an hour. So I can sadly not show this on this examination, plus that I don't have another piece of quartz. But there's one final thing, of course, which some might want to know, and that's why is this effect occurring? And well, at least within salts, the reason for the color change is because the energy, the ionizing radiation, is exciting electrons in the K and M shells around the well, the metal in the salt and they are trapped in this excited state due to how the crystalline structure is built. So it kind of gets stuck in the excited state until it's, it absorbs a, t a small amount of visible light and that kind of bumps the electron back to its original spot and because of this it emits all the excess energy in the form of this beautiful blue color or orange or whatever and it's a similar effect in these crystals and that also shows that because they are good because they go back to the original spot once they are absorbed visible light the color change is indeed not permanent at least not in salts they seem to be permanent in crystals or minerals, but salts lose the color change after a few hours or even less in under a lamp or just regular light. Which is quite sad. And uh, yeah, that should be everything. Here's the tube, a bit close up. Oh, and one more thing, of course. Just to show that the tube indeed is within regulatory limits for any police that might be stalking me, I'll also show you the radiation do dose rates outside the tube. Once I'm running it, I'll set up my radio scan and the glass again and show you the dose rates. So here's the tube, I got the glass set up. Got my radio scan. Let's turn it on and see if we get anything outside the tube. Turn on the pump. And I'll turn on the power supply at 20 kilovolts. Yeah. See. As you may hear, there's no real increase in radiation. Maybe a little bit right at the side. It's still very low. Of course, without the glass, the dose rates are quite high. But it should be okay as it's within this lead and glass chamber. 
it does not exceed the regulatory limits which are that it cannot be run over 30 kilovolts or with a dose rate over one microsievert at a distance of one decimeter from the apparatus which this did not exceed now it was a short measurement which should prove that it's no danger or not even in, in any way but anyway this has been this little short experiment i know it's quite rushed i'm sorry if it's messy 